Okay, this video walks us through how we would quantify centripetal acceleration for an object moving in uniform circular motion. So what we mean by uniform circular motion would be an object moving in a circular path like this one at a steady speed. So it's not speeding up or slowing down, it's not accelerating in that sense. But it is accelerating because as it moves around the circle, the velocity vectors uh, would be changing their direction. So when we talk about centripetal acceleration, we're talking about changes in just the direction of the velocity vector, not the size. Okay, so um, if we imagine this object um, moving along this circular path, perhaps we pick a couple points of interest. Maybe we want to see what happens as the object moves from here to some small distance away along the arc of the circle to here. Um, I could represent the velocity at each point with a green vector. Let's say tangent to the circle is in this direction at that point. And over here I've come around the bend and now my velocity vector is kind of pointing in this way. So I'm going to do my best to make those vectors the same length because that would be necessary for um, uniform circular motion. The speed is not changing just the direction of motion along my circular path, okay? So let's define a couple of other um, quantities here. Let's look at the radius of the circle. That ends up being important. So if I draw a line here and here, both of those lines have radius r, length r, and that's going to kind of define where the object is at this first position and this second position, okay? Just to label some things, let's go ahead and just call this angle theta, which we're going to assume is a small angle. Uh, we're going to make some assumptions based on the fact that this angle is not rather large, but instead rather small. So this is a bit exaggerated. You would really want to do this analysis with objects even closer together on the circle. So it's a bit expanded. Um, keep that in mind. Okay, so in general, if we're talking about acceleration, kind of one of our most general definitions, if acceleration is uniform, which it would be in this case, the acceleration can be quantified or calculated as delta V over delta T. So we kind of have a vector 1 here, a velocity 1 and a velocity 2. They have the same magnitude, same speed, but what's different is the direction. So I'm going to try to apply this idea um, to this vector sense of how the velocity changes. So in general, this delta V um, could be represented in this case as V2 minus v1. Okay, but I want to think of that in a vector sense, because if I was just thinking magnitudes, there is no difference in the magnitude of these uh, velocity values. Um, of course, that's divided by delta t. We'll come back and need that in a moment. Okay, so how do I add, or how do I figure out the difference between v2 uh, and v1 um, in a vector sense? Well, I could think of it as v2 plus negative v1. That would be the same as saying v2 minus v1. And how do you make a vector negative? You switch its direction. Okay, so if I, um, let me copy this, this v1 vector. If I want to make it negative, I simply flip its direction. So this vector would represent negative v1. Okay, and then how do I add v2 plus negative v1? Well, the graphical way to do that is take the second vector, put it tail to tip of the first, and then the sum of those two vectors, which I'll do with the dashed line, would be represented by this new vector here. Okay, so let me label some things, get us caught up. This downward pointing vector was negative v1. This dashed vector would represent the sum of v2 plus negative v1, which we're saying is delta v. 
Okay. So that vector divided by a change in time would represent the change in velocity. Okay. So again, keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back and use that fact. So now let's shift our focus to um, this angle here. What I want to do is kind of tie the shape of this triangle to the shape of that triangle. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time to prove it, but if you imagine um, taking those two lines, so let me grab those and group them. If I take those two lines and kind of rotate it a bit, if everything's drawn to scale, what we can see is that's the same angle that's shown in this diagram here. Um, so let me go back to what it did look like. We can kind of prove to ourselves, hopefully, that this angle theta is the same as this angle theta. So what we're going to end up with is two similar triangles, two triangles um, that share an angle. Um, they may not necessarily be the same size, but the angle here would be the same, okay? So keeping that in mind, um, again, these black lines represent R, the radius. And what I'd like to represent then is this length here, okay? from my starting point to my ending point. Now, we can see that that's a straight line, yet we have kind of a circular arc here. But again, we want to imagine if we made this angle very small, this straight line starts to become a closer and closer approximation to the curve. So for very small angles, we could say that however far I go along the arc is equal to that straight line distance, okay? So how do I quantify that? If I want to know how far something goes, let's just say displacement, change in position, delta x. I can always just take the speed times the change in time, right? Well, in this case, the speed happens to be the speed at which I'm moving around the circle, right? So I could take a small delta t um, and realize that that's true. So this side length here could be represented as a change in position, which would equal delta V over delta T, okay? So I've got these two similar isosceles triangles. Isosceles because this side length would equal that side length, and this side length equals that side length. And going back to geometry, this might be a uh, proof that you don't necessarily remember or an identity that you remember. If you have similar isosceles triangles like these two are, one of the things you can say is that the ratio of the bases will equal the ratio of the sides. And I think that makes sense, even if you don't remember specifically learning that proof. So if I took the ratio of uh, this base, which is the short side, to this, that should equal the ratio of this length to this. Okay, so I'm going to set that up with some values that I've defined here. For base 1, okay, Base 1, I'm going to take from this triangle, so delta B. That would make base 2 delta X, or V delta T. Okay. And that should equal the ratio of the side length. So. I grabbed delta B from this green triangle, so I need to grab the side length from that triangle. So the side length we could represent in terms of length as V1 
or v2, which is just that steady speed that the object is moving around the circle. So I'm going to plug that in as v. Again, that would be kind of like the um, absolute value of v1 or v2. Again, this is uniform circular motion, so those values are, are all one and the same. And I need to compare that to the side length over here, which is r. Okay. So now I have a quantity that I can work with, and I'm going to start to um, use some algebra to just rearrange that. Okay. The first thing that I can do is if I want to get rid of this v down here, which represents the speed of the object around the circle, I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides of the equation times v. Okay. That cancels this and this. And now what I end up, end up with over here is v times v, or v squared. So let me clean that up a bit. And what I'm left with on the left-hand side of the equation, once I've canceled my v's, is delta v over delta t. And of course, delta v over delta t is the definition of acceleration. So now I have proven that the centripetal acceleration quantitatively equals v squared over r. And that's a useful equation that is usually skimmed over in high school physics books. But we can see just from the geometry of the situation why that is true. Now taking that a step further, remembering that the way we relate net force to mass and acceleration is Newton's second law. So F net equals MA, hopefully a familiar equation for you. What we would use this for in this case is to create this inward pointing acceleration at any point. I would need a certain amount of inward pointing force or centripetal net force. Well, now that I have a way to represent the acceleration, I can plug that into this equation. So for centripetal motion, or for uniform circular motion, I should specify, we have a specialized version of F equals MA. F net equals M times the centripetal acceleration, or v squared, over r. And that's a useful equation as well, because that will help us quantify the amount of net force required to keep an object in uniform circular motion, given a certain mass, a certain speed, and a certain radius.